All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Paul Jordan, and I'm uh, the chief of GI here, and uh, been around for uh, a little while. And uh, so, one of the one of the things that I thought about that you you might wonder is how in the world does someone choose what topic they want to do for Grand Rounds. Because we get invited to do, to do Grand Rounds, but they don't tell us the topic. They just say, you know, do what, what you'd like. So the question is, well, how would you choose that? Well, I, I chose actually to do a medical legal Grand Rounds, um, but the lawyer that was going to work with me wasn't available to do it this time, so we'll do it sometime in the, in the, little, in the future. So keep your... Uh, your eyes peeled for that. It's going to be a fun time. So the other, second way that I approached it was, what do I see day to day that isn't done as well as we might do it? And what sort of things can I bring to a group of internists that might help them deal with things in a, in a way that I think is a little bit better than, uh, than we're doing right now? So I started to th think about this, and I decided to do the topic would be ascites, because I see ascites all the time, you see ascites all the time, and so let's sort of look at where we are. So let's think about a patient, and the reason I chose this particular patient is because it's not unusual to have this sort of a person in your clinic. We've got this uh, young man with uh, a history of cirrhosis. It doesn't matter why he has cirrhosis. He has portal hypertension, ascites, peripheral edema, coagulopathy. <clears throat> but he also has a history of mitral valve disease, heart surgery, mitral valve replacement, coronary bypass, and now when he develops uh, heart failure, he, he gets tricuspid insufficiency. So all of a sudden, we realize that we're, we're playing again with input pressures into the right uh, side. He has no signs of congestive heart failure other than the ascites and the peripheral edema. So we start worrying mostly <coughs> about that. And in the process of treating him, he develops renal insufficiency. And uh, so now we're stuck into that very difficult wedge of where do we go from here? because we've exhausted what we, we think are our, uh, our conservative measures to treat him. Now, all of these things are somebody that you may see this afternoon in your clinic. It can be this straightforward. So I use that kind of as a, an illustration. The other interesting thing as I prepared this was to realize that 40 years ago I gave a lecture very similar to this talking about virtually the same issues, and not much has changed in that 40 years. A little bit has, but not much has changed. And we were emphasizing some of the same issues that we're in emphasizing today 40 years ago. Hard to imagine. So how do we approach the ascites? What do we think about and do about with the renal insufficiency? And how much is this tricuspid insufficiency contributing to our problems? And how do we figure that out? Or what do we do about it? Or can we do anything about it? So let's think about the mechanism of ascites with, and I'm gonna, most of uh, all of what, most of what we're talking about today is going to be ordinary ascites from portal hypertension. We'll mention some of the other causes, but the focus today is gonna be portal hypertension and, and, and ascites. So we get the portal hypertension, we increase the nitric oxide that's circulating, this leads to vasodilation, and then vasoconstrictors and so on get, uh, get created, and we end up basically activating the renin-aldosterone uh, uh, system and uh, a little bit of vasopressin probably. So it's as simple as that. The problem is we've created pressure problems, we've released the nitric oxide, We've gotten vasodilation, the, the volume goes down, we, the body has reacted, and now we're starting to retain sodium and water. So the key is the retention of the sodium and water, and then the distribution of the sodium and water based on the pressure changes that have occurred with the portal hypertension. So when you're thinking about liver disease, we think of the two sides of liver disease. We think 
of the hepatocellular effects of the liver on the liver, and we think of the fibrotic effects or the pressure effects in the liver. And it helps to think of that as you're treating your patients in the, uh, in the uh, clinic because you need to ask the question, is the liver disease affecting things like coagulopathy and protein synthesis and, and, uh, and so on? Or is what you're dealing with a pressure problem from healing of the inflammatory component and therefore production of the fibrosis? So in, when we're thinking about portal hypertension, obviously we're on the fibrosis side. So in order to control it, we need to take control of the whole situation. <laughs> and we need to take control not only of what's happening in the body, but of the things that are creating our problems, such as the salt and water. And so sometimes that can be a problem. If you may have a patient in whom you're getting all sorts of uh, effects but you're not able to take control of what they take in, both salt and water. If they go and eat a bag of potato chips and drink a half a gallon of beer, uh, that's not going to help you in your ability to con control the uh, ascites. So what do we take control? We, we, we got to think about the portal pressure, the flow, and remember, of course, that the pressure is going to be related to flow. We're going to be concerned about the availability of sodium and water. And people who like salt often like water. People who like water often like salt. And uh, neither of these are great things for somebody with uh, extra free water. We've got medications that affect the amount of salt and water. And think about when you're using antibiotics and so on. Look at how much salt, how much sodium you're actually giving when, when you do this. And all of a sudden, you'll realize when you're, you're contributing to the problem. And then factors affecting the intrahepatic pressure, the fibrosis, and so on. But also inflammation. For example, alcoholic hepatitis gives you uh, swelling of the cells, it increases the portal pressure. And if you can get rid of the alcoholic hepatitis by having them abstain from alcohol, or if you have somebody who's obese, has metabolic syndrome, and they're depositing fat in the liver, that increases the portal pressure as well. If you can control the fatty deposits in the liver, you cannot help to control the portal <coughs> pressure and therefore the differential between the systemic and portal circulations. So all of these things have to be going through your mind at about the same time. Well, what other things do we think of when we first see them? What other, what other things may be creating this and masquerading as portal hypertension secondary <coughs> to liver disease? And sometimes we, and we, we get invited to go see somebody because they have uh, elevated uh, liver enzymes and they're worried about cirrhosis. They do have some ascites and peripheral edema. And the problem is actually just the tricuspid insufficiency from their heart failure. Remember to examine the liver, look at its size, look at the, uh, the jugular venous pressure, look for giant V waves. Uh, about probably a dozen times a year, uh, we get the great satisfaction of pointing out to uh, people that uh, the real problem here is actually heart failure and tricuspid insufficiency. So cardiac disease can do it. Uh, every once in a while we get fooled with carcinoma everywhere in the peritoneal cavity, whether it's uh, ovarian or whether it's pancreatic. Uh, it can be very, very many different things. And then there are vascular problems such as Bud Chiari syndrome. Or constrictive pericarditis can give you uh, portal uh, hepatic vein uh, obstruction and pressure. Or we can get lymphatic obstruction or leak from people with tumors, and you can get chylus ascites, okay? ascites with uh, lymphatic uh, fluid. Um, okay, so how are we going to do it? Well, you know, we all do paracentesis. The thing that we have learned is that that's a little bit different is that seldom has there ever been reported problems from coagulopathy from doing an ordinary paracentesis. You're going through the abdominal wall. You don't need to be loading them up with fresh frozen plasma to get their INR down to 1.5. You just just suck it up and go ahead and do it. The uh, the, you're, you're putting a small needle, 
creating a small hole into a peritoneal cavity that's full of uh, ascites, you're not going to you're not going to hurt anything. So don't get don't get to putting in uh, you know half a dozen uh, units of fresh frozen plasma on the way in. You, you only need to draw off a fairly small amount. You don't need to take off five or ten or fifteen or twenty or thirty liters of uh, of fluid. The record, by the way, apparently is 45 liters that was taken off at one time. And the interesting thing, in that patient that had 45 liters taken off, they had no hemodynamic instability, which was interesting. So that's the other thing that's a little bit different. We've always talked about having to replenish some of the albumin because of this question of hemodynamic instability. But apparently, it's incredibly rare and, uh, and so we don't need to be really too, too worried about it. If you suspect infection, if you suspect spontaneous bacterial parit peritonitis, don't send a sample to the lab. Just get blood culture bottles. Take them to the bedside and inoculate them right there at the bedside. It's the best way to get it. Remember that, that and we're going to talk about this, the infection in ascites is usually a very small number of actual bacteria inside and so that you, uh, you really need the best possible system to try to isolate this uh, usually uh, single organism. So if you suspect that, then hit that with the blood culture bottles. Get a cell count uh, from the uh, EDTA tube, the purple tops, and the chemistry from the red tops. So first of all, what are we going to do? We're going to look at it. Well, if, I mean, if it's cloudy as blazes or uh, opalescent, they may have chyle, uh, chylus ascites or, or lymphatic ascites. Um, if it's brown, it may be that it's just ascites and there's bilirubin in it, so we don't need to get too, too excited. Um, the, the, the cloudiness to it, it's usually very clear, but the cloudiness to it indicates neutrophils. And it's not that unusual to have a little bit of blood in the, in the tap. That doesn't necessarily mean you're dealing with peritoneal carcinomatosis. Um, so you can do a red, red cell count or a hemoglobin on it and see whether you've got a whole lot of blood. But it's, it's not unusual to have a little bit, and we shouldn't really sweat it too much. So what, what should we order? Well, we used to order all sorts of things, some of which were valuable and some of which weren't, but all of which cost a whole lot of money. So the simple things. There are three simple things to order. A cell count, because you want to know whether there's more than 250 polys per, and, and an albumin, because you want to know the, the concentration of the amount of albumin that's, that's in there in order to do the SAG, and you want to know maybe the total protein, because the total protein may be significantly abnormal. If you think that it's uh, infection, hit it, with, hit it with a culture. Well, Sorry, less helpful. <coughs> Seldom do we need an amylase. It's not worth ordering. If you think you've got pancreatitis, get a serum amylase, and then you can think about this. But it's, it's not worth it. The number of organisms in ascites is so small that a gram stain is not likely to be very helpful to you. You're much better off to just take some fluid and culture it, because the culture techniques uh, give you a result pretty quickly. If you really think you've got an elevated uh, white count and you, and you really think you've got infection, you, you're going you're gonna to hit it with antibiotic anyway. So uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about a gram stain. Glucose is only effective if you're really looking for uh, infections. And culture, of course, we talked about. Occasionally, if you think you're dealing with tumors, cytology can be helpful. But if you are going to do cytology, take larger amounts out, have them concentrate it, spin it down, and even then you may or may not get good, good results. But if they can get a plug of cells that they can then uh, put together in pathology, that can be helpful to you. Bilirubin may or may not be helpful, and TB culture is singularly unhelpful most of the time. It takes a long time for this thing to culture out, and it's not going to give you a great deal of uh, effect. If you really think you have TB, you're going to be treating it long before this culture is going to be back. So we measure this serum to ascites albumin gradient. 
And the, the key is that this is not a, not a ratio. This is a gradient, okay? It's the difference between the amount of, of albumin in the, in the serum and the amount of albumin in the acidic fluid. And if it's greater than 1.1, 97% 90, of the time, it's just going to be portal hypertension creating your problem. Okay? So nice and simple. Look for your SAG. If it's high, you know you're dealing with portal hypertension. <clears throat> the albumin reflects the uh, hydrostatic pressure and is pushed out into the acidic fluid. If it's less than 1.1 uh, difference, then it may be that there's albumin or protein exuding from tumor or something similar out into the peritoneal cavity. So uh, a, uh, anything less than 1.1, you, you want to th start thinking about tumor. So remember, it's not a ratio. It's just a, it's a separation of the, of the two. So that's kind of, kind of interesting. There's two kinds of infections. There's spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is the one that we're going to be concerned with most all of the time. <clears throat> this is a small number of organisms. It's uh, not a, not a uh, urgent sort of thing. It's urgent to get it treated once you know it's there. And it's the one of the things you should be thinking about whenever you see somebody with ascites. But it's not all that common. Secondary infection is from some sort of either surgical problem or some problem that needs surgery, okay? <coughs> so if you find yourself with, with a, what appears to be a secondary uh, infection in the acidic fluid, start to think of what perforated or what, uh, what leaked bacteria into the acidic fluid. <coughs> so when we are thinking about a, a bad infection in, in the acidic fluid, do the white count, the glucose, and the protein, because the, the white count will be up, the glucose will be down, and the protein will be up. So those are the three things, really simple, that, that will get, tell you what's going on inside the acidic fluid. <coughs> so in surgical, uh, I, I, did I say protein up? It's protein down. Um, glucose be down, protein down, and the LDH, if you measure it, will be high. We don't usually measure LDHs now, but we did in the past. Okay, so what about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis? Usually they're polys greater than 250. If you have lymphocytes, they're probably not an infection. It's usually a single organism. It's usually culture positive, and there's no history of a relevant surgery or no <clears throat> surgical emergency that uh, people need to be thinking about. And the actual bacteria is probably in there and translocated from the, uh, from the gut. Most of them have no symptoms whatsoever. So it's only you that are going to suspect that there's infection. They may come in with mental status changes and you think, oh, well, they've got a little bit more hepatic encephalopathy of the, what have they been doing? They've been taking medications or so on. They may have some abdominal pain and they may occasionally have fever, but most of them don't even have fever. Three bacteria are the most common, and these are the ones to remember. The e. coli, again, from the gut, pneumococci, interesting, and Klebsiella, those three things. All the rest of the bacteria that we see in there are less than 1%. Oh, and uh, what less than 1% are anaerobes. So we're not thinking anaerobic, we're thinking aerobic mechanisms. What are the risk factors? When are we going to see this? Well, we're going to see it when we least suspect it, is, is kind of my thoughts. But we need to think about immune dysfunction, people with HIV, people with tumors, people with infections, people with malnutrition. We need to think about it when the amount of protein in the acidic fluid is low. Um, and I, I kind of find myself thinking about this in terms of the opsonins. Is there, is there less uh, attacking the bacteria at that point in time? And then episodes of GI bleeding, particularly variceal bleeding, are uh, a great risk factor for uh, acidic fluid uh, infection. 
And as you know, you, we probably realize that most of the time that we ban varices, we will give them antibiotics prophylactically to try to prevent uh, acidic fluid infection. So if we think about this and then we put together, how can we remember this nice and simply and, and, and when we're in the emergency room at 4 o'clock in the morning, how can we remember what we should be doing? It's really simple. Cefotaxime <clears throat> for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis works very nicely, 8 hourly for 5 days, then stop. You don't, need to, you don't need to do another tap to be sure that they're done. You can watch them clinically. You may want, if you, if you want to give them albumin, give them a gram and a half uh, per kilo, and then uh, a gram per kilo on day three, and that's all. You don't need to give anything more. You don't need to give it every day. You don't need to give huge amounts. If you find that on, on culture it's polymicrobial, and you th really are thinking that you're in that less than 1%, you may just use some metronidazole on top of it. And if you're sure that you've got bad infection, you may want to go for more than the five days. But ordinarily, five days appears to be, to be plenty. <coughs> well, what if we're worried about a patient who is immune compromised, who is malnourished, who does have a tumor? What, what sort of way, what about prophylaxis of these things? And this really only started a very few years ago. And norfloxacin, and though we, we don't use much norfloxacin these days, but ciprofloxacin, uh, just once a day. And if there's uh, associated with variceal bleeding, we may do it for twice a day for seven days. But uh, just um, prophylactically, ciprofloxacin. Um, one of the questions is, are we going to then select out a different bacteria um, that's going to be more of a problem for us than, rather than less? And the answer appears to be no, we're not. Um, you know, we've been doing this for a few years. We don't seem to be getting into resistant bacteria. But this is all, this all may change in the next few years. We may suddenly discover that all of a sudden we're, we're having much more difficulty with these things. But right now we, we're not. Um, what are the risk factors? We mentioned the low albumin in the, in the acidic fluid, it's previous episodes of bacterial peritonitis, and variceal bleeding. Variceal bleeding keeps coming up because these are the people who we see regularly with variceal bleeds. <clears throat> And now with the with banding, I mean, think about it. you. You guys don't see it, but we basically go down. We put rubber bands on these varices. You go back down in a couple of weeks. There's these big ulcers in the middle of the esophagus. It's it's amazing that they don't get uh, infected more than than they do, and it's amazing that it all works as well as it does. Uh, but it 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 seems to. All right. Well, let's go back to the thoughts of. What are we going to do with the ascites in this circumstance? Well, the first thing is abstinence from alcohol seems to be a reasonable thing to do. You know, you can argue that you're, you're decreasing the amount of alcoholic hepatitis and therefore decreasing the inflammation and therefore decreasing the pressure in the, in the, in the, the liver. But <clears throat> It just seems reasonable that if you've got these kind of troubles, abstinence from alcohol seems to make sense. I think we have to educate the, the patients on both diet and on fluid. Okay? Diet, the amount of salt. Uh, you've got to, they've got to start looking at what's in the salt. Look at how much Tony's they're putting on their food. Look at how many times they eat potato chips. Look at how many times they get uh, you know, a plate of fried catfish. Um, all of these things we need to look at. I had a, had a patient who, who loved to drink fluid. And I, I said to him, well, how much fluid do you drink in a day? He said, oh, gallons. Well, I'm pushing away trying to get rid of his ascites, 
And he's pouring gallons in the top. Now, how many gallons? I don't know, but apparently more than one, because he always used the S on the end of the word. So, and he, he, he liked to, to uh, make, it was a fruit drink that he drank. I don't know, it's just kind of strange. Um, a, a no added salt gets you close to a two gram sodium diet, but two grams of sodium basically is you cook with the, the, the salt, but you don't add salt to your food. They may need fluid restriction. We try not to give so much fluid restriction today as we used to in the past. We, we would really restrict them uh, severely in the past. Today with the diuretics that we have, we don't generally need to do this as much. We also used to put them to bed. We thought putting them to bed for periods of time, it would uh, mobilize the fluid and uh, all we ended up was, was creating trouble. So bed rest is no longer uh, anything indicated. If you think that you've got adequate control, measure the 24-hour urine sodium or measure the 24-hour or measure the sodium potassium ratio. If your, your urinary sodium is more than 78 millimoles in, in 24 hours and you're not losing weight, then there's some other problem that you need to be looking at. Okay, so you're pushing out enough sodium, but you're not getting the effect you anticipate. Start looking around as to what's happening. Are they taking in huge amounts of fluid? Are they taking in huge amounts of sodium? And so that they're excreting lots of it, but they're not actually excreting enough to pull the, the water. So look at the sodium intake. Again, if the, if the ratio of sodium potassium is large, look at the intake again. And we tend, to th we tend to forget to talk to the patient about exactly how much fluid are you taking in and trying to get them to quantitate it. It's very difficult because they don't, they're actually probably drinking a lot more fluid than, than you think they are, particularly here in the, in the, uh, in the warmth in the summertime. So what do we need to do? We need to treat the physiology, obviously, and the physiology we talked about was the renin-aldosterone system, because that's the, that's the basis of why we get ascites. We need to watch for complications like infection and encephalopathy and so on, and we need to anticipate infection. So we follow them closely, we, we particularly, I find, watching weight, blood pressure, and mental status. So weight, to me, is the real key. I tell people if they don't have a scale, go buy one. It's a, big in, it, it's a better investment than most everything else they're going to buy right now. And so get a scale, weigh exactly the same time every day, when they, either when they get up in the morning or whenever they want. But I find getting when they, and, and I ask them to write it down and ask them to bring that log with them when they come to see me. And you'd be surprised how many people think they haven't gained any weight, and you look at the log and they're 20 pounds up. And you, you know that this is all fluid. Um, the other thing it can do is that if you're finding that they're losing more weight more quickly than you think, or they get into trouble, you can say, well, look, you know, you're 40 pounds less than you were three months ago. Uh, you haven't lost that much muscle weight. Uh, watch the mental status. Avoid non-steroidals and beta blockers because they can, they can change blood pressure and change renal excretion and, uh, and tubular effect. So, you know, you may end up uh, with someone who's taking this. And, of course, non-steroidals are available over the counter. So you need to ask them to bring in all their medicines because uh, I, I, I can't tell you the number of times we've gotten caught with that. They uh, ask them, are you taking non-steroidals? They don't know what you're talking about. Um, so you bring them in and have a look at them. Uh, <clears throat> the mainstay of treatment is spironolactone, aldactone. And it's been that for 40 years. But the key that I find is that we find people who are being treated for their ascites with 25 or 50 milligrams of spironolactone twice a day. Totally inadequate. It's not going to do the job. If you're going to start with spironolactone, 
basically we start with 100 milligrams and we use 100 milligrams of spironolactone, 40 milligrams of lacing. If that doesn't do the job, we go to 280. If that doesn't do the job, we go to 300 and 120. <coughs> and so we kind of stair-step these things. 40 years ago, I remember talking about this to an audience and saying we go up fairly quickly to 400 milligrams a day and 160 milligrams of Lasix if we need it. So don't hesitate to use peronolactone. If you begin it without the Lasix, remember to watch the potassium. But, you know, general, this is just ordinary stuff. But the thing that I see more than anything else is these small doses of spironolactone. And then the patient has morositis and peripheral edema, and they end up coming in and getting a uh, paracentesis. And all of a sudden, they've lost 10 liters of fluid or 5 liters of fluid. Well, the problem with that is, remember, we were measuring the albumin in the fluid, right? And we were looking at the difference between the albumin in the serum and the albumin in the fluid. Where's their protein manufactured? It's in the liver. We've already got liver disease, and now we're going to take 100 grams or 200 grams of, of albumin or protein, and we're going to throw it in the toilet and expect them to replace that. Remember that, that you're going to replace it. It's, it's an osmotic pressure thing. You're going to replace the, the albumin and, and fluid inside the belly in no time. And the next thing you know, you're throwing it all away again. So we're gradually depleting these people of their protein. But we're not using adequate doses to push it out through the kidneys. So it's much safer and a better deal to push it out through the kidneys. Now, that's not to say that you don't need a, a large volume paracentesis from time to time. If the patient's compromised breathing, or if they're not able to eat anything because they've got this tense, tight belly, <clears throat> then a therapeutic paracentesis can be very helpful. But I will tell you, that I can't remember doing a, paras a, a therapeutic paracentesis in the last 25 years. That makes it kind of uncommon because I end up seeing some of the most difficult ascites. So why do I not need to do a, a therapeutic paracentesis? Because we work back, and this is the same theme that we were talking about 40 years ago. <coughs> Remember that the half-life of spironolactone is 24 hours. You only need to give it once a day. You don't need to split it up. Remember when they split it up and they take it, they take it with a glass of water. So you're increasing the amount of fluid that they're taking in again. So once a day, give your Lasix and spironolactone once a day. Don't give Lasix, of course, late in the day for reasons that we all know. What other things might we use? Well, amiloride, yes, we can... We can substitute that. It doesn't tend to have as much gynecomastia as the spironolactone does. And I've seen gynecomastia so big and so difficult and so tender that it really does limit your ability to, to give them enough. But uh, most of the people, when they realize that that's what's happening, they tough it through. Um, but it, it can be a problem. But, and if you get into that, then the uh, amiloride's probably a reasonable thing. Recently, a little bit of midodrin has been effective. You can start with five milligrams TID and then increase it. And then if you have to, a large volume paracentesis. Now, there are lots of people who don't think that paracentesis is as bad a deal as I do. I, so realize that I'm standing out here on the one side of all this. But I think that what happens is you deplete their proteins, you eventually get hypoalbuminemia, you eventually get more and more ascites, and you're basically just draining them to death. And so if we can avoid that, I think it's a better deal. If we can leave them, remember that the albumin that's in the peritoneal cavity is actually in balance. It gets absorbed and, and, and pushed out again, absorbed and pushed out. 
So it actually is, is a balance. So you're upsetting the, the oncotic pressure. So what happens, what about if you have to do this? Well, first of all, the thing that we think that we feel today that we did not feel in the past is that there's little risk of cardiovascular collapse. So we don't need to be quite as, uh, as aggressive at giving more fresh frozen plasma or protein or albumin and so on. The problem with it is that it makes the patient feel better. Now, that doesn't sound like it should be a problem, but it is a problem. And here's why it's a problem. You've got this guy who comes in with his giant belly. He's uncomfortable. He's miserable. He comes to the emergency room. They take off 10 liters of fluid, and he goes home happy as a clam. Okay? He feels better, feels great, everything's fine. And on the way home, he has a couple of beer and a bag of potato chips. Okay? Because he's all better now, right? And so what happens is you're actually training the patient to look for the paracentesis. And we see it all the time in our clinics. People come in with ascites, and we're talking to them about their diet and what they should be doing and so on. And their whole aim is, well, Doc, why don't you just stick a needle and take it all off? Because I'll be fine after that. Well, yeah, for a short time. But we end up having to argue with these patients after they've had therapeutic paracentesis once a week for you know, three months. So it may ease the breathing and the food intake. <clears throat> it may contribute to protein depletion. Remember that diuretics safely do the job 90% of the time. Okay? So what do I do? <coughs> what do I do? if I don't do therapeutic paracentesis. What we try to do is change the physiology and go to a tip shunt, where we're changing the portal systemic difference in pressure. OK, so what is refractory ascites? Well, that's when, in spite of the diuretics and in spite of adequate treatment, you still have significant ascites that's interfering with their ability to function. At that point, they have a one-year survival of 32%. It's not a lot. There's a 50% two-year survival at the time of the onset of ascites in liver disease. 50% of them will be dead within two years. So we avoid the beta blockers, uh, the angiotensin receptor blockers. So what about the downside? I think that it encourages dietary irresponsibility, and I think that's the biggest problem with it. It may well deplete the proteins. Interestingly enough, if you compare therapeutic paracentesis and tip shunting, there's actually not a longevity difference. There's, there's a quality of life difference, but not a longevity difference. Um, and, if you think about opsonins as, as a way that the infection is controlled on the day-to-day -day basis, if you do a therapeutic paracentesis, you're tossing them away. <clears throat> if you're using diuretics, you're actually concentrating them in the acidic fluid. So that seems like a reasonable thing to do. Tip shut changes the gradient has superior efficacy over paracentesis, but no survival advantage. And certainly, they can get hepatic encephalopathy. Now, the nice thing is that we can generally treat hepatic encephalopathy with uh, lactulose and zyfaxan, and really, they can lead a pretty, pretty good life. Um, that's a much better deal. Now, if they get a TIPS and they get encephalopathy and we can't control it, then they were on that downward curve anyways and we weren't going to be able to get them to survive anyway. The tip shunt can close over it, they can go back in, they can open it back up again and now here, um, you know, they're, they're putting in smaller shunts so that they're not changing, not shunting as much blood and then they can go down with the balloon and open it up a little bit better if they have pressure changes that they need to adjust. 
So uh, Dr. Ahuja in, in radiology does a fantastic job with this. So we still risk uh, closure. It may need reopening. Um, back in <coughs> years ago, uh, we did things we called peritoneal venous shunting, a Levine shunt or a Denver shunt. Basically, what that was was a one-way valve. You put a catheter in the acidic fluid, and you the one-way valve you could actually pump, and you could drop it into the superior vena cava. So you were actually pumping acidic fluid into the superior vena cava. It did relieve the ascites. The problem is that if they got spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, it was instant sepsis. And so they would end up dying with sepsis. The other thing is that they almost all developed uh, DIC. And so they could die with DIC. So these, these back in the 70s and 80s, we used a lot of them. The last one I used was uh, about uh, 16 or 17 years ago. Um, and um, so we, we tend to stay away from those. What's happening now in uh, Dr. Ahuja is doing splenic embolization to decrease the flow in the portal tract. And he'll infarct a piece of spleen, <clears throat> the total flow through the splenic vein into the, into the portal vein decreases, therefore the pressure decreases, and uh, that, that's been helpful. Other places don't do splenic embolization, but uh, he's very good at it and he seems to have a pretty good success at it. So, what do we want to take out of all of this? What is the, what is the message that I wanted to give to, to you to help you to do a better job with ascites? Remember that the onset signals a 50% two-year survival. So this is a serious illness. This is not just fluid that's overload. Diuretics work 90% of the time. So you can control this 90% of the time. The other 10%, we've got some other things we can do, including tip shunting. <clears throat> Infection is subtle. It's often fatal. Infection is bad. Nutrition is important, and the amount of protein that the patient has inside, not the amount of protein that they take in, the amount of protein that they have inside them, the amount of protein that they generate, is the key to survival. And if you watch them, you can watch these people. If you're taking off ascites, you can watch the muscle just fade away. If, you're, if you treat them with, with diuretics, you conserve that protein, you can see them build muscle back up. You can start by seeing it in the thenar eminences and then they start to fill in up here. Look at their chest, get their shirt off every time they come in so you can, you can gaze at these ribs that are sticking out on these people who are severely malnourished. And they will actually begin to fill in, they get better. And it's a really good feeling to see someone actually regain their, uh, their, their tissue, their body tissues. And it's all possible. Uh, but we've got to use enough diuretic, and you have to be careful as you do it. You may have to see these people. I have them in my office that I see every two weeks. I mean, I literally see them every two weeks, measure what's going on, have a look at them, weigh them, look at their muscle, look at their coagulopathy, and so on. And if you do, you can build them back up to normal-looking people, as long as they don't have too, too much damage in the liver. All right. Any questions? How about risk of As long as as long as your creatinine is not is not climbing, okay, then you're not likely to precipitate hepatorenal syndrome. Um, hepatorenal basically is a fatal situation. It's a hundred percent fatal if they really develop epidorenal. And so the, uh, the chances of you precipitating that with, that with diuretics are small, as long as you're watching that you haven't got total intravascular volume depletion. I mean, if they come in and they're dry as a chip, like the ones that come in from a nursing home that, that haven't eaten or drank in some time now, uh, that, that can precipitate it. But most of the time it won't. And, and if you... If you rehydrate them, 
then they'll, they'll usually come back unless they have hepatorenal. If they have hepatorenal, they're done. It's toast. Two comments. One is um, with regard to norfloxacin. It is available in town. It has to be pre-ordered at most pharmacies. It's not covered by most insurances. Yeah. So if, you so do, if you do get it, the pharmacy will upcharge it because they don't use it very much. And the last time I looked to get it, it was $700 or 14-day supply with insurance. So, so you're better off with Cipro. And there's no reason not to use Cipro. Bactrim. Yeah, yeah Bactrim is the other alternative. <coughs> the reason I don't tend to use Bactrim is that, it, that they can become sun sensitive. And here in the south, that's a real problem. If you, they go out and they, get, they come back looking like a tomato. The, the second thing is with regard to the blood culture inoculation. Yeah, <coughs> encourage it, but in the last year, CLIA has come out and said that you, unless your machine is specifically designed for ascites and validation, <coughs> what I've been finding is they are rejecting them. Because when I go back to look for it, they reject it. And that's at both major Here? hospitals. Really? They've been I, hadn't, I, I didn't realize that. So. They've been rejecting it. When I go in and ask, well, why did you reject it? It's a clear violation. So they run right into the problem there. So the federal uh, government interfering at, with the practice they're of They're at significant medical legal risk if I order a blood culture uh, bottle to culture something and they refuse to do it. I, th I think that I'd point the finger quickly at them in court. So I would encourage you to do it, but they may reject it. Like, okay, so everybody just be aware of that. If that happens, if you guys do one on the wards and they reject it, send me an email and let me know that it's been, it happened. Because I think there's good evidence that this is the best way to do it. John, would you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Clear has gotten to be the museum that has interfered with a lot of what we do. Uh, which would be typical common sense, like inoculating plates from spinal fluid to bed mm -hmm. Oh, I right, can't do that. You've got to have that in the lab, because only the lab people can do that. But they'll put it in the refrigerator overnight and do it in the morning. And do it in the morning. Yeah, yeah that's the problem. And of course, if you only have a, a small number of bacteria, yeah. you're far better. And they're, they're literally for documents, so you're far better off putting it in a blood culture bottle. Absolutely. And in fact, um, I mean, I can show you a chapter and verse where it's in the texts. That but way. after arguing for two hours, I, I gave up. Well, we probably shouldn't give up, should we? No, but I, what, that's what you're going to find is they're going to reject it. Yeah. And well, then the you interesting thing is they reject it, and the evidence of <coughs> what do you mean you're rejecting it for what? If it grows E. coli, which is consistent with what, what, you expect, what you've got. Yeah. We would have something I work with. You would reject that answer? No. Clay? You just say, oh no, it's not E. coli because, well, um, this machine, we rejected it. This machine is not validated by the FDA. <coughs> it's the the function of the machine, and when we got a microbiologist here, it's not. He's gone. And he became absolutely enamored with the machine. And the bureaucracy of Korea. It made it very, very difficult to get an answer. And by the way, if anybody's been around here a long time, remember how long when Ann Rambin used to run the lab between the time you got the blood culture and you got the answer and susceptibility? It was 24 to 36 hours. It's now three to four days with our super duper machines. Thank goodness we've got them. And now we got rid of all of the technicians who could actually be technicians. So when a machine goes down in the lab, oh, there's problems. Because everybody knows how to run it, how to get the machine working, or how to do the technical stuff in the lab. Any other comments? Anybody from the trenches? Yeah. <laughs> To come in for like a therapeutic cap, I know you don't like it that much, but if they do come in, should we be sending for diagnostic uh, workup as well, even if the suspicion of SVP is low? Can I answer that? Yeah, yeah go ahead. The AASLD guidelines state that every patient admitted to the hospital with ascites deserves and needs and requires a diagnostic paracentesis, period. So everybody that enters the building with ascites gets a paracentesis every time. Well, 
diagnostic. Yeah. I mean, I think that's all well and good to be dogmatic about that, but I think you have to you know, also choose, you pick and choose, especially in an institution like ours where, remember that what we, the money that we use for this is not available for that. And someday we may have a situation where you say, well, I really need this for this patient. And they say, well, yeah, but we don't have any money. So we can't have it. Can I answer that question? Yes, always. Uh, anytime you tap somebody, send it for uh, yeah. cell hand differential with them. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, the discomfort the patient may be telling you is due to large volume societies, maybe early as we did. It's not expensive to do cell hand. It's not, it's not expensive. You don't need all the other stuff, but at a minimum, just get a cell yeah. Remember the, the three things that we talked about that you sent. But that's all I would send. I wouldn't send. Yeah, and, then, and that's what I'm and referring to, cell count, culture, and uh, albumin. And the other, the other interesting thing is using sterile technique, your chances of you infecting the acidic fluid is small. But remember, it is a sterile procedure. You've got to do it right. So just do it right. I had one patient in Sanguinic from a paracentesis. Um, we we get a vessel and they, they bled into the, into the peritoneal canal. Well, don't go through the vessel. <laughs> that's, that's simple. Just don't go through the vessel. But on the flip side, we've seen patients die because they received excessive FFT yes. prior to uh, uh, getting a paracentesis because the clinicians were afraid <coughs> of. Uh, causing bleeding yeah. from their paracetes. Yeah. And yeah. that is very rare. <coughs> it's safe to, to do a paracetes on somebody's IR. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the uh, yeah. you, you heard about the Z technique so that you don't get leakage. Um, mm. and, and basically that the, the Z technique is very straightforward. When you're doing it, pull the skin down, go in, take your acidic fluid off, when you pull the needle out, you let the skin go, so now there's a, a more difficult path. <coughs> the other thing I learned recently is I had a patient who had a lot of ascites. <coughs> they did a tip shunt on them, and they, they had leakage afterwards from taking off the acidic fluid beforehand. And so their answer to that was to sew the leak closed. Well, what that led to was the fluid going into the subcutaneous tissue, including the scrotum and the legs and, and so on. So you, if it's going to leak out, it's going to leak out. Uh, I, I don't think I'd sew it closed. And if they do leak, which, what position do you put the leak? Do you put the leak high or do you put the leak low? You put the leak high because gravity is plays here and the gravity will pull the fluid down to to drain if you put the leak on the on the uh, ventral or lower surface so you want to put it remember that we talk about <laughs> pressure being 10 centimeters of long so the pressure at the top of the water <coughs> column is greater than the pressure at the bottom all right good